Let's take a moment to hear from this week's sponsor, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Pre portioned ingredients help cut down on food waste, while step by step instructions make cooking a breeze, not so much of a chore. HelloFresh gets that you want options when it comes to what you want to make for dinner. Not just the same old thing all the time. That's why they offer 40 recipes to choose from every single week. So you'll never get bored and you can always find something new to try and love. And personally, that's why I love HelloFresh because I live alone and it's easy for me to turn to HelloFresh for a quick and easy meal. So go to HelloFresh.com slash who killed 50 and use the code who killed 50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash who killed 50 and use the code who killed 50 for 50% off plus free shipping. This is America's number one meal kit. So enjoy HelloFresh. Wireless data. It's what connects us to just about everything. And full power license spectrum is how it gets from point A to point B. Americans will use five times more 5G data by 2027. To make sure all Americans benefit from secure, reliable 5G networks, we need more full power license spectrum. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. Slow Burn Media and Evergreen Podcast presents Who Killed? A podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless had killed more than a dozen people and eaten some of them in his Milwaukee apartment that was literally a house of horrors. There are uh, 11 uh, individuals uh, or parts thereof that were recovered. We have also, in addition, through our investigation, determined that the suspect may well have been involved in at least 17 homicides. Tracy Edwards escaped from Dahmer's apartment and testified at Dahmer's trial. Find as to who you were sitting next to who was doing all these things. A bizarre individual, someone that was very confused at this time. There had been an earlier tip. Milwaukee police got an emergency call about a 14-year-old Laotian boy in similar circumstances, but did not investigate. Two officers were later fired. The result was inevitable. 16 life sentences. Not enough retribution for the sister of one victim. Hello and welcome to episode 159 of Who Killed? I'm your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media and Evergreen Podcast production. On this week's episode, we are going to be talking about one of the most infamous serial killers in United States history. We've kind of crept into some of these higher profile cases this year, and it doesn't get any more grisly than the case against Jeffrey Dahmer. And we'll start with his arrest on July 22nd, 1991. And that's when Dahmer's killing spree came to an end. Two Milwaukee police officers were flagged down by an agitated man with handcuffs attached to one wrist. Tracy Edwards, 32, told the officers a quote-unquote freak had placed the handcuffs on him and that he had spent the better part of the evening trying to escape from a nearby apartment where he is being held captive. Dahmer had met Edwards earlier that day, and somehow he actually persuaded this guy to come over to his apartment. Now, when they got there, Edwards immediately noticed there was some kind of foul smell and noticed some hydrochloric acid. Dahmer had tried to place handcuffs on Edwards, succeeding only in fastening the one wrist before he brandished a knife, pulling Edwards toward the bedroom where Dahmer said he intended to take nude pictures. Continually repeating, he was Dahmer's, quote, friend, Edwards waited until his captor had a lapse of concentration, whereupon he punched Dahmer in the face. In the confusion, Edwards fled through the front door, eventually flagging down that police car. Now, this is when you have to really feel for the officers who arrived at the scene, because when they did arrive, 
Dahmer actually invited them in, admitting it was he who had placed the handcuffs on Edwards and that the keys were in his nightstand. Now, on entering the bedroom, one officer noticed a partially open drawer filled with Polaroid pictures and numerous bodies in different states of dismemberment. Hmm, if I'm a police officer, I'm going to say this is not normal. Now, brandishing the images, the officer returned to the living room and reportedly said to his partner, quote, these are for real. So, you see these images. Dahmer attempted to escape, but was quickly subdued by police. This guy was not the most... Um, I mean, he was a bigger dude, but not the most physical, I guess you'd say. So when authorities actually opened up the refrigerator, that's when they found the severed head of a black male that was sitting on the bottom shelf. Ugh. And they would go on to discover four more heads in Dimer's kitchen. There were also two human hearts in the refrigerator. Seven skulls were also found in the bedroom. And an entire torso was in his freezer. Okay, just going to say this. Pretty weird, right? Doesn't sound like a normal guy to me. And luckily, the police realized that this is probably not the situation that they expected, but needed to make some sort of arrest here. So they arrested him, and Dahmer stated that he said, this is what he stated, he said it was glad it was over but he found it exciting and thrilling. And that is according to the files from the FBI vault. And there are a lot of files in that vault. It is pretty amazing and disgusting. So when authorities asked Dahmer if it would be possible to lead a normal life if he were ever released, the murderer responded, the best place for him was prison, because if he ever got out, he would go right back to the same behavior, including killing. So I'm pretty sure that, you know, these officers were doing the right thing. So you wonder, how does a man such as Jeffrey Dahmer end up with a collection of human bodies in an apartment in Milwaukee? Well, he had a fairly normal childhood other than a few bumps in the road. In 1966, the family moved to Doylestown, Ohio, and that's when... His mother, Joyce, gave birth to Jeffrey. And actually, no, that, I take that back. Um, Jeffrey was allowed to choose the name of his new baby brother. That's what happened. And this is when he chose the name David. Now, the same year, Lionel had earned his degree and started work as an analytical chemist in nearby Akron, Ohio. Then... In 1968, the family moved to Bath Township, and I believe that is the home of, uh, well, at least he has a residency there, King James. And uh, this address was their third in two years, and Dahmer's sixth address since marriage. So, I guess you could say he didn't really have a very steady childhood. Now, this house did sit on uh, one and a half acres of land, so there was a small hut. And, of course, as any budding serial killer would do, he began collecting animals and dissecting them and figuring out how to, oh, I don't know, preserve the skeletons. And from his freshman year, now this is according to uh, one of the books that is about Jeffrey and his younger life, that he actually began drinking at by his freshman year at Revere High School. Now, small little tidbit, I used to run against a guy named Trevor from Revere, and uh, that's kind of weird because that's not that far from uh, where I'm sitting right now, so pretty gross. And by the age of 14, he had begun drinking beer and hard alcohol in the daylight. Now, of course... Not a good sign if you're a teenager and you're day drinking. It's never really a good sign if you're day drinking to begin with. But, hey, he was drinking scotch also, which, man, I can tell you what, I hate scotch, and I am 
definitely at an age where I could enjoy scotch, but I find it it tastes like paint thinner. But hey, whatever. So Dahmer actually he ended up realizing he was gay. So I guess that's something to think about. Um, this was the 70s, so there was definitely a stigma, of course. Now, he again became obsessed with death. He did the classic impaling of animals in his backyard. And his first real opportunity to do something crazy was when he was driving and he saw a young man by the name of Stephen Hicks. And Stephen Hicks was disappeared on June 25th, 1978. And he was the first victim in the long list of victims in Jeffrey Dahmer's life. Now, Stephen Hicks would also be the last of the murders that he would be charged with. Asked his plea to the first count, Dahmer responded, Guilty as charged, Your Honor. And again, Dahmer was sentenced on February 17th in Milwaukee to 15 consecutive life sentences for the 15 murders there. Now, he was not charged in a 16th slain because, for whatever reason. But either way, Martha Hicks, Stephen Hicks' mother, said her son... Quote, his smile could keep him out of trouble most of the time, but then he never met anyone before like this monster. Quote, I will be not be able to pull the switch on the electric chair, but if I could, I would on this animal. I hope he serves all 800 years, or whatever it is, she said. Now, this did give relatives an opportunity to speak out. Uh, this is according to the Associated Press. And, you know... The fact that we have the death penalty in Ohio, um, it was not in effect at the time during Hicks' murder, so that was not something that he was going to be put up, you know, he wasn't going to be murdered. And, or, I shouldn't say. To the politically correct people, I apologize, that he would have been put to death by the government. And uh, that was, again, just because of the fact that it was not in effect at that time. And so you're wondering, okay, so what happened here? See, Dahmer is 18, Stephen Hicks is 18, and, well, it really worked out this way. Um, Dahmer's parents actually left to go to Chippewa Falls and... Dahmer just decided to stay at his parents' house and while they were gone, and, you know, that's when he committed the murder. And according to Dahmer, the sight of the bare-chested Hicks standing at the roadside stirred his sexual feelings. Although when Hicks began talking about girls, he knew any sexual passes he made would be rebuffed. So after some drinking and talking and listening to music... Of course, Hicks wanted to leave. So, because, I mean, I believe Hicks was on the way to a concert. So, Stephen Hicks, poor poor guy, just hitchhiking, which is normal in the 70s, gets picked up by this absolute lunatic. And Dahmer stands over him and gets behind him and bludgeons him in the head with a 10-pound dumbbell. He said he later struck Hicks twice from behind with the dumbbell as Hicks sat upon a chair. When Hicks fell unconscious, Dahmer strangled him to death. And that was with the bar of the dumbbell. Then he stripped the clothes from Hicks' body before exploring his chest with his hands and then doing something disgusting above his corpse. And then, the following day, Dahmer decided, well, let's move on from animals to humans and decided to dissect Stephen Hicks' body in his basement. Now, he would later bury the remains in his backyard but he did decide to move them later because he was worried about them being discovered. And again, like I said, um, Hicks was the last of these victims that he was held on charges at the uh, 
you know, in court. And you have to wonder, you know, Dahmer's profile, if you look at it, what the hell was he doing between 1978 and 1987? I mean, it's just not normal for serial killers to go that direction, you know, where they have committed a crime and then they're like, oh, you know, I'm I'm cool. And then all of a sudden they go into this other crazy state and they kill 15 people. I mean, it's just not that normal. So you got to figure there has to be some murders in between those years, between 1978 and 1987. And again, this was... Quote, a serial killer's first murder is often an anomaly. This is according to Peter Vronsky, a serial killer expert who had researched Dahmer for his book, American Serial Killers, The Epidemic Years, 1950 to 2000. Now, this was from the A&E True Crime uh, dot com, and he said, quote, serial killers sometimes commit their first murder by accident or spontaneously on an impulse without much planning or fantasizing about it beforehand. Well, in this particular case, I would say Dahmer really did fantasize about it. And again, he was just 18 years old when he killed Hicks. And that is much younger than the normal age or average age of serial killers. And that is, again, according to experts. And then, quote, Dahmer was developing his sexuality and he re realized he wasn't like other people. He was gay. Unquote. Eric Hickey, a criminal psychologist at Walden University and an expert on serial killers, told A&E True Crime, quote, Dahmer was still developing himself. You don't see too many serial killers become serial killers as teenagers. Most of them are still exploring their sexuality, and they really start to act out more in their 20s and 30s. So, again, Dahmer was, like, fueled by these sadistic desires and... He was engaging in fantasies about being with people who were not alive. And I'm sorry, but that's pretty disgusting. So, um, you know, the article that I'm reading from is is from the A&E true crime episode that they did on Dahmer. And they talk about how Dahmer went to extreme lengths to avoid rejection. And this likely started during his childhood. And this is according to Hickey. His father worked long hours as a research chemist, and his mother suffered from depression, which likely meant they gave Dahmer little attention. When his parents divorced in 1978, Dahmer's father, mother, and younger brother all moved out, leaving Dahmer alone in the family house in Bath Township, which, again, is a northern suburb of Akron, Ohio. Quote, the sense of abandonment and rejection was just overwhelming for him, Hickey says. He progressed to the point where he knew when he took men home, they were never going to leave, no matter what. The trauma in childhood helps develop fantasies that then fuel the behavior. So it's, again, a very interesting thing to think about. The reason why I'm talking about Hicks so much is because it's local. I mean, he went to Coventry High School. Again, I ran against a lot of guys from Coventry High School. Friends and family described Hicks as being friendly and compassionate. And following Hicks' disappearance, his parents did everything they could to find him, and they even hired a private detective and put out a reward. So, again, let's go back to those nine years where these murders weren't going on. And, um, and apparently, if you listen to Dr. Christine Sarteshi, uh, she told A&E that... Um, Though Dahmer did not commit any murders during those nine years, it's possible that he did keep killing after Hicks, but never got caught. In 2017, two soldiers who were stationed in Germany with Dahmer told the Daily Mail that they were drugged and raped, but apparently decided not to kill them. You know what I mean? Dahmer decided not to kill them. That's just... I could see that happening. Um, he probably didn't see a chance of getting away with it if he did. So that's just kind of what I'm going to say. Um, the German police did investigate if there were any murders in the area, but they did not find any. And again, she goes on to state that it wasn't like he didn't know what he was doing and drugging people and all that other stuff was wrong. He knew it was wrong, and he did it anyway. 
He just kept moving towards these behaviors. And it's also possible that Dahmer was simply trying and largely failing to create a normal life for himself after killing Hicks. It's really not clear how long the killing hiatus was, and he was able to avoid committing murders. It could have also been that he was trying to get his life together, unquote. So, Robert Hoyles of the Akron Beacon Journal wrote this about Stephen Hicks. A 19-year-old Coventry Township youth is believed to be the first victim of serial killer Jeffrey L. Dahmer. Stephen Mark's Mark Hicks was hitchhiking to a rock concert when he disappeared on June 18, 1978. Dahmer, formerly of Bath Township, told detectives that a photo of Hicks looks like the man he killed, police said Saturday night. In addition, Dahmer's father, Lionel, said Saturday that his son, 31, would plead not guilty to the killings by reason of insanity, and they could be linked to the bones that were discovered in 1982 in Twinsburg. Dahmer told police he picked up a hitchhiker and invited him home to the 4400 block of West Bath Road for a beer. And again, Dahmer said he'd strangled the man. This is leaving out the gory details. He told detectives that he dug up the body a short time after the killing because he was afraid it would be discovered. He said he broke up the corpse and scattered the bones on the property. So this is where I want to interject a little personal experience here. Sitting at the dinner table, we watched the news as kids. And being from Cleveland, well, guess what they talked a lot about? Jeffrey Dahmer and the fact that Dahmer's first victim was from the area. So during dinner, pretty much every lead story would be searching the area for these bones. It was really an interesting uh, and unavoidable story. It was kind of shocking as a kid, needless to say. So... On February 18, 1982, two garbage bags filled with bones were found in a wooded area behind a Twinsburg factory. Dahmer was interviewed extensively over the last two days by Lieutenant Richard Munsey of the Bath Police Department and Detective John Carabados of the Summit County Sheriff's Department. Sources familiar with the case said that when detectives showed Dahmer a picture of Hicks, Dahmer denied that Hicks was the victim in Bath in 1978. When de- Detectives showed him a second and better picture of Hicks. Dahmer said it did look like his first victim. Now, the last person to have seen Hicks alive was his brother, who dropped him off at about noon on that June 18th day in 1978. And this was at the westbound entrance ramp ramp to US 224 at Waterloo Road. Now, Hicks was planning to attend a rock concert at Chippewa Lake Park in Medina County. Now, if you want to do some interesting urban exploring um, just via internet. Google Chippewa Lake Park. It was uh, it was a venue back in the day and it's uh, it was an amusement park that got taken over by the woods. It's really one of those abandoned places. It's really very interesting. So when Mrs. Hicks reported her son missing, she told sheriff's detectives that Stephen had promised he would return to their prior road home in time for a birthday party for his father Richard. When Hicks disappeared, he was wearing blue jeans, blue tennis shoes, and a necklace with a red cross, according to the missing persons report. He was described as 5'11 and 160 pounds with long brown hair. So here you have Stephen Hicks going about his day, and all of a sudden, here comes Jeffrey Dahmer driving down the street. And what does Jeffrey Dahmer think? Well, he thinks this guy is coming home with me. And it's kind of uh, kind of insane. I mean, it really, it really is. And he told, and I'm gonna play this clip for you. It's it's a long clip, but it's an interview from Inside Edition, and uh, it's it's very interesting, and it's definitely worth listening to. And we'll talk more about it for sure in the coming weeks. And again. Dahmer told Inside Edition in 1993, quote, I was coming back from the shopping mall back in 78. The first killing was not planned. I had fantasies about picking up a hitchhiker and taking him back to the house and having complete dominance and control over him. The hitchhiker was, again, Stephen Hicks. Now, Dahmer would not murder again, as I said, until 1987, 
but in those intervening years, he had joined the army, as I mentioned, and he was in Germany. Now, he was eventually discharged due to excessive drinking. Shocking, after this gentleman started... Gentleman, why did I just call him that? This monster started drinking at age 14. Scotch, remember? Scotch, gross, eh, whatever, each his own. So, Dahmer gets you know, discharged from the military. Now, he briefly did come back to Ohio, and he lived with his parents following his discharge, but was arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct, for which he was fined and received a suspended jail sentence. Hoping his grandmother would be a tempering influence on on their son's ongoing drinking, well, Dahmer's parents sent him to live with her in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Hmm. Well, in 82, Dahmer was arrested for indecently exposing himself at the Wisconsin State Fair Park. So I guess he wasn't really not doing anything. He was doing some stuff. Now, in 1986, he was again arrested for disorderly conduct for masturbating in front of two boys. Not good. Not good. You guys, people, this is something that, you know, should have been on the ball here because... He was charged with disorderly conduct, and he was sentenced to one year of probation and told to undergo counseling. And this is what he told authorities, that he was just going to the bathroom. So, yeah, another drop-the-ball moment there. So, if Stephen Hicks was the first victim, then the second victim was Stephen Tuomi, 24. And he took him back to a hotel room And he says that he awoke the following morning to find him dead alongside his bed. Dahmer would later tell authorities that he had only planned on drugging Tiomi and had no recollection of beating him to death with his fists. Placing the body in a suitcase, Dahmer transported it to his grandmother's basement, where a week later, he dismembered it and placed it in the trash. Except for the head, of course, which he retained for a further week before boiling it in industrial detergent and bleach, eventually pulverizing the brittle skull. Okie dokie. Pretty sweet. This guy is awful. So we've got another victim in October of 1987. See, now what you see in this pattern here is he's picking up his pace, and it's becoming something that he cannot control. So Dahmer brought 14-year-old James Dockstater to the basement of his grandmother's house. And this was after he had promised him 50 bucks to take some nude photos. Well, he drugged him, strangled him, and disposed of his body. Then March 1988. So talking about four or five months later, who knows what he was doing in between that. Richard Guerrero met Jeffrey Dahmer outside a Milwaukee gay bar. And guess what he did? He offered him 50 bucks to return to his grandmother's house to spend the night with him. After drugging Guerrero with sleeping pills, Dahmer decided to strangle him. And then he performed sexual acts on the corpse. So he's also a necrophiliac. Something you have in common with Ted Bundy. Look at that. Crazy. Nose crazy. So... This time, Dahmer dismembered the body within 24 hours, but hiding his killings and the dismemberments, according to this article, was becoming increasingly difficult. So, Dahmer probably made a game plan, and he actually gets arrested in September. And Dahmer's grandmother had become annoyed with his bringing men to the house late at night, And with those foul smells emanating from the basement, I mean, again, death does stink. Just saying. Just like Gacy's parents, which we'll talk about soon. Or mom, I should say. And cousin, sister, whatever. Like, what the hell? Dude's killing people and burying them in your house. You think you'd smell it. Just saying. So, what happened? Okay, so Dahmer gets arrested again. And... It was within days of securing a one-bedroom apartment. Dahmer was arrested and charged with second-degree assault, sexual assault, that is, and enticing a child for immoral purposes after luring 13-year-old, I apologize for the pronunciation, 
Kisan Synthasophone back to his apartment, where he drugged and molested the boy before his intended victim escaped. Taking his story to police, Dahmer spent a week in jail before being released on bail. <clears throat> yeah, guys, I'm I'm beginning to see some patterns here that I don't like. Um, other than the fact that he's killing somebody every other month. Um, I'm not liking the fact that the authorities aren't really doing their job. I mean, it's like, take a little bit closer of a look. Maybe bring in a psycho, you know, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. Maybe have a man analyzed. Because this guy sounds like he might be more trouble. So, we're going to talk about another killing. And this is in March 1989. I would have been 10. Cool. And that was model Anthony Sears. Now, this was Dahmer's fifth victim. He was 24. They met at a bar. Now, Dahmer was fearing that his apartment was being watched by police. So, he took him back to his grandmother's basement again, where he drugged him and strangled him. Now, this was the first victim who, for who Dahmer took trophies, meaning he actually stored and preserved Sears' head and genitals, which he kept in a wooden box. And that, for a time, he stored in his locker in a box at work. So, you want to be Jeffrey Dahmer's co-worker? Well, uh, yeah. Interesting, but uh, probably not the best. You know, it's really one of those things. Dahmer is just absolutely insane. I mean, he's truly insane. So, he goes, um, he gets 12 months in jail with work release. Now, this is sentenced to 12 months of jail time and five years of probation for the second degree sexual assault. Now, Dahmer was permitted, permitted work release in order to keep his job as a mixer and at Ambrosia Chocolate Factory while also being required to register as a sex offender. Paroled from jail two months early, Dahmer rented an apartment at 924 North 25th Street in Milwaukee. So, do you think at this point Jeffrey Dahmer stopped killing? You know, he was in jail. He, he was probably punished, right? Well, I don't know about that. But I do know that we need to hear from this week's sponsor. China is making 370% more 5G spectrum available than America. Tell Congress to restore FCC auction authority and allocate more 5G spectrum to make sure America leads the industries and innovations of the future. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. You guys know relationships take work. But did you guys know that the most important relationship you have in your life is actually the relationship you have with yourself? You know, we go out of our way to treat people well. And a lot of us will drop anything we're doing to help someone we care about. But we have to ask ourselves, how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? I go out of my way to take time each day to focus on myself. It's become an essential part of my routine. This month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you that you matter just as much as everyone else does. And therapy is a great way to make sure you, that you show up for yourself. Listeners of this show know I'm a huge proponent of mental health. I have personally been in therapy since I was a kid. So, BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp Online Therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Who Killed listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash who. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash who. All right, we are back. So, 
Everybody's got a theory. But nobody knows the real reason for Dahmer's secret. And we'll probably ever never know. But there, again, so many interviews and interesting things to check out on YouTube that I definitely recommend it. Again, I am going to include that in the end of this episode. So that will be available. Again, you also have a link in the show notes that you can use. So with that being said, I will be traveling next week to Denver. Yeah. And I will be doing my thing out there and we'll be doing some, uh, Podcasting from the road, as well as some skiing and some more, um, hopefully get some actual uh, episodes of Big Mountains and Old Friends out there, because that would be uh, nice, considering COVID struck and kind of ruined uh, pretty much that whole thing. So that was sweet. So let's hope that's not the case, and uh, this trip is a more successful trip. Because I really feel like I want to do some great adventuring. And with that being said, you will hear from me next week in part two of Jeffrey Dahmer. And then following that, we will be doing John Wayne Gacy. And that will be with everyone's favorite guest, Nick of True Crime Garage. So, again... Thank you guys so much for listening. And as you guys know, I do drop new episodes every Friday. And don't forget, I will be on Podcast Row at CrimeCon 2022 in Las Vegas. That's April 29th through May 1st. If you want to save money on your ticket, you can use my promo code WHOKILLED. If you enjoy this podcast, you can help support the show by donating directly with my username, on Venmo at Bill-Huffman-3 or via PayPal. You can find me wherever. Every contribution does help keep these shows running. Now, you can help support the show also by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Those five stars help keep the important cases that I cover in the spotlight. If you'd like to stay up to date with the cases that I have covered as well as the shows that I have coming down the pipeline you guys can always follow me on Twitter at Bill Huffman 3 again thank you so much for listening until next time please be healthy and definitely stay safe so what I'm going to play for you guys here is actually an interview with Nancy Glass of Inside Edition I apologize for the person who's introducing the segment he is a bad person and nobody should listen to anything he says but the interview with Dahmer is very interesting and I hope that you guys will take the time to listen to it again that's Inside Edition Nancy Glass the awful Bill O'Reilly and uh but Nancy Glass does the interview so Just bear with Bill O'Reilly for a minute, and you'll be good to go after that. So enjoy the next 20 minutes. I desensitize myself to it. I, 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 uh... I don't know. I went to great lengths. He is pure evil, but you'd never know it by looking at him. But when you hear him, that's another story. His killing field was Milwaukee, and he got away with murder for more than a decade. But how could any of this happen? For the first time ever, Nancy Glass is here inside the world of Jeffrey Dahmer. Bill, when I sat down opposite Jeffrey Dahmer for this interview, I wondered what he would tell me, how hard it would be to get him to discuss his horrific crimes. What I found was that he was very forthcoming. He volunteered details that may be difficult to hear. I began by asking what he wanted from the men he picked up. I had uh, these obsessive uh, desires and and, uh, thoughts wanting to control them, to, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, possess them permanently. And that's why you killed them. Right, right. Not because I was angry with them, not because I hated them, but because I wanted to keep them with me. And uh, as my obsession grew, 
uh, uh, he was saving body parts such as uh, skulls and uh, skeletons. Jeffrey Dahmer is recalling his monstrous past. Almost two years ago in this little apartment in Milwaukee, police discovered the grisly remnants of one of the most horrible crime sprees in American history. Jeffrey Dahmer, an unassuming chocolate factory worker, would eventually confess that he had seduced, murdered, and dismembered 17 young men. He even ate some of his victims' body parts. He instantly became the center of worldwide media attention, a serial killer unmasked. There were protests and press conferences in Milwaukee as people tried to understand how this could have happened in their midst. How did Jeffrey Dahmer get away with murder after murder for 13 years? How did a boy born into a hard-working middle-class family turn into the worst kind of monster imaginable? In this exclusive interview, we put those questions to Jeffrey Dahmer himself. We met with him at the maximum security prison where he is serving his sentence of 999 years. For the first time, he I, I talks any, about his I'm crimes like and gives us a chilling look inside the mind of a serial killer. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, when you uh, depersonalize another person and view them as just an object, uh, an object for pleasure instead of a, a living, breathing human being, uh, it... it seems to make it easier to uh, do things you shouldn't do. The reason why Jeffrey Dahmer was able to get away with his crimes was because of just what you are seeing here. Jeffrey Dahmer is intelligent and articulate. That is what makes him so frightening. But if you listen carefully to his words throughout this interview, you realize it is a thin disguise. You do sound, though, like the kind of person who could have said to himself, this is wrong. I must stop. I always knew that, that it was wrong, but uh, uh, after the, f the first, the first uh, killing was not planned. I was uh, coming back from the shopping mall back in 78. I had had uh, fantasies about picking up a, a hitchhiker and uh, taking him back to the house and uh, having complete control and dominance over him. The hitchhiker's name was Stephen Hicks. He was just 18. Jeffrey Dahmer took him to his parents' house. There he strangled him with a barbell. He dismembered the body and hid it in a drain pipe. It was Jeffrey Dahmer who gave those details to the police in his confession. No one, no one had a clue as to what was happening for, for over a decade. During that time, Jeffrey Dahmer joined the army and was sent to Germany. He was eventually discharged for a drinking problem and returned to Ohio. Nine years after Stephen Hicks' murder, the killing began again. What happened to you in the nine years in between that you were able to stop, that you were able to control yourself? It just wasn't an opportunity to uh, fully express what I wanted to do to do. There was just not the, op the physical opportunity to do it then. And uh, I started, when I moved to Milwaukee in 81, uh, I started reading pornography, going to the bookstores. Um, eventually that led to uh, frequenting the gay bars. And then I one time I brought this uh, young man back to the hotel room, the Ambassador Hotel. Uh, was just planning on drugging him and uh, spending the night with him. Had no intention of hurting him. When I woke up in the morning, he uh, had a broken rib here. I uh, was heavily bruised. Apparently I had uh, beaten him to death with my fists. And you have no memory I of it? I have no memory of it. But that's what started the whole spree all over again. Dahmer says he snuck the corpse of his victim, Stephen Toomey, out of his hotel room in a suitcase. Then he took it to his grandmother's house, where he cut up the body and put it in plastic garbage bags. When you killed these men afterwards, were you repulsed? Were you upset? 
No, it, at the time, uh, it, was, it was almost addictive. It was almost uh, a surge of energy. Uh, I wouldn't have to uh, worry about um, any of their needs or anything. I just had complete control of the situation. But Jeffrey Dahmer was out of control. The urge to kill had overpowered him. As police later learned, he wasn't satisfied with his victim's death. He wanted more. Why did you photograph them? It was my way of remembering uh, their appearance, their physical beauty. Uh, I also wanted to keep something, if I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. And uh, I even went so far as planning on uh, setting up an altar with uh, the uh, ten different uh, skulls and skeletons. And what was the purpose of the altar going to be? Uh, as a sort of uh, memorial, uh, a, a point where I could I don't know. It's, it's, it's so bizarre and strange, it's hard to describe. A place where I could collect my thoughts uh, and feed my obsession. When the bodies were still in your apartment, there was no time when you would see them and say, this is grotesque, what have I done? There were times, there were times, but the compulsive obsession with uh, doing what I was doing overpowered any feelings of revulsion. This man with a quiet, almost shy demeanor became a master manipulator who was able to lure strangers he met at gay bars to his apartment. He was even able to con the police into returning a 14-year-old boy to him after neighbors called 911 upset that the child was in the street naked and bleeding. Dahmer convinced the police that he and the boy were simply having a lover's quarrel. It's an uh, intoxicated uh, boyfriend of another boyfriend. <laughs> well, how old was this child? It wasn't a child, it was an adult. After the police left, Jeffrey Dahmer murdered that boy, Conorak Synthesomphone. This man says he had a near-fatal encounter with Jeffrey Dahmer. He wanted to take some picture of my back. He hit me with a rubber hammer on my neck. He was lucky to escape because by then the killing had become almost routine. Before you went out to pick up a man, was there any kind of ritual you went through? I'd go to the nightclubs, uh, drink, watch the, uh, the strip tea shows. And uh, if I didn't meet anyone at the bars, I'd uh, go to the bath clubs and uh, meet, meet someone there, offer them money, and we'd go back to the apartment. Um, have a few drinks, I'd have the, uh, the uh, sleeping pill mixture already prepared. Person would drink it, fall asleep, and uh, that's when they would be strangled. Watching the movie Exorcist 3 was also part of his ritual. It put him in the mood for murder. I felt so hopelessly uh, evil and perverted that uh, that I, I actually derives a sort of pleasure from watching that tape. Did you like feeling evil? No, no I didn't, but uh, I had tried to overcome the thoughts and it worked for a while, but eventually I gave in. While Jeffrey Dahmer and, uh, may say uh, things today that make it seem like he understands office what office went office. on in his mind, he does not. All he can do is tell you what happened, but he cannot stop whatever it is that drove him to kill in the first place. Do you still feel those same urges? Do you still feel that compulsion, that obsession? Uh, I wish I could say that uh, it just left completely, but uh, no, there are times when I still do, still do have uh, the old compulsions. Jeffrey Dahmer says as time went on, his mind became more and more warped, and yet he was clever enough to continue to elude police and lure young men to his apartment. We should warn you, the details are very graphic. I started having these obsessive thoughts 
uh, when I was about uh, 15 and 16, and they got worse and worse. What were your fantasies about? Uh, they were sexual fantasies of control, power, uh, complete dominance. Uh, they became reality. Was there pleasure in that fantasy? There was excitement, uh, fear, pleasure all mixed together. Jeffrey Dahmer fulfilled his fantasies by murdering and dismembering 17 young men. In time, his desires became more extreme, his deeds more grotesque. Listen to him talk about the most unnatural things in the most matter-of-fact of ways. That's when you realize that none of it has touched him. I was uh, branching out. That's when the cannibalism started, eating of the heart and uh, the arm muscle. It was a way of uh, making me feel that uh, they were a part of me. It, it, for, at first it was just curiosity, and then it became compulsive. Then I tried to uh, keep the person alive by inducing a zombie-like state, um, by uh, injecting... Uh, first uh, dilute acid solution into their brain or uh, hot water and uh, it never did completely work. Could someone like you be stopped? Could you be helped? No, I, I was I was dead set on, on going with this compulsion. It was the only thing that gave me any uh, any satisfaction. He became so warped by his evil impulses that he even took a victim's head with him to work at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory. I kept the, uh, the mummified uh, head and skull of one of the victims in uh, a, a carrying case in my locker at work. Were you almost flaunting it? Yes, but that's how strong the compulsion was. That's how bizarre the, the desire was. I wanted to keep something of, of the person with me. Jeffrey Dahmer exhibited some disturbing behavior early on. He began drinking heavily as a teenager, dropped out of college, was arrested for indecent exposure, disorderly conduct, and fondling a 13-year-old boy. Tragically, one of his murder victims would be that boy's brother. Do you know what started it? Was there any kind of incident that you can remember? To this day, I don't know what started it. And, uh... The person to blame is sitting right across from you. That's the only person. Not uh, parents, not society, not pornography. I mean, those are just excuses. His macabre 13-year crime spree finally ended when this man, Tracy Edwards, brought the police to the infamous apartment. Like the others, he had gone there with the promise of money. He was listening to my heart because at a point he told me he was going to eat my heart at that point. I hit him I, and I ran. What was the turning point for you that made you suddenly realize that you had done something terribly wrong, something you should be sorry for? It was uh, the night of the arrest. I have no memory of what happened uh, during the six hours before uh, the last victim ran out of the apartment. I heard a knock on the door and the police were there uh, with, with the last victim. Uh, they asked me where the key was to the handcuffs. And I was, my mind was in a haze. I s sort of pointed to the bedroom, and that's where they uh, found the pictures. And they, they yelled, cuff him. And I was uh, handcuffed. And uh, it, it was just the realization that there was no point in trying to hide, hide uh, my actions anymore. The, the best route was to help, help the police identify all the victims and just uh, make a complete confession. When it was revealed that most of the victims were black or homosexual, people in Milwaukee were incensed. Many felt that was why he went after them and why the police didn't seem to care when their families reported them missing. Ten of your 17 victims were black. Okay. Were they racially motivated? It, it was crimes? not racially motivated. It was not uh, sexual preference. It was just to find an obsession with uh, the best-looking 
young man I could find. While you just heard him say that his sexual preference had nothing to do with the killings, no. he has not come no. to terms I'm with his really homosexuality. Honest. Never understood it. There was no use trying to fight it because I, I couldn't rid myself of it. It was, it was too powerful and persistent. Do you dislike it? Yes, it's caused uh, a lot of problems for me. A lot of conflicts and uh, unanswered questions. The conflicts remain with him, and so do his compulsions. But in prison, he finally cannot act on his savage desires. If you were out on the street now, would you still be committing the crimes? Probably. If this hadn't happened, there's no doubt I probably would be. I can't think of anything that would have stopped me. Three AM, the comedy horror podcast that holds weekly gatherings around the campfire. Let me tell you what you're gonna get. You're gonna hear stories about demonic possessions, prison stabbings, skinwalkers, glitches in the Matrix, cult leaders, missing 411, night marchers, Operation Paperclip, Mesopotamian devil worship, and so many monsters it'll give Kanye West a runaway for his money. Pop and meme culture also aren't off topic. A camp where laughs and scares are constantly competing for first place. We're just a group of friends trying to bust each other's balls, find the best stories, and expand the circle in the process. 3 a.m., the comedy horror podcast, not for the faint or fragile of heart. Let's go. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Sheree Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures.